I challenge you to compete in this simulated investing tournament to win some serious money. I hope you'll join us. I'll be coaching you every step of the way. Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to uh, another real conversation. How about how about those graphics? You know, we're getting all fancy over here at Hedge. I think they're trying to make me look younger. Uh, Mike, I'm not getting any younger. This is not our first bear market, and and welcome, Mike Taylor, for uh, having an open discussion about what uh, I've called the biggest bubble in capital market history. And again, it's not stocks, just stocks. You can't just talk about stocks. You got to talk about all of capital markets, which includes crypto. You're one of the few people. Um, that's been open and honest about this. And, and moreover, when we have our conversations, I figure out that you're more net short uh, most of the time than I am. <laughs> so welcome. Yeah. Well, welcome to the Grizzly Bear Show. And I didn't want to, um, we don't want to scare people, you know, because you should be, if you're on the wrong side of this so far for the first nine months of it, you should be plenty scared already, okay? Uh, many of you lost like all your money in certain crypto things. So we, can't, we shouldn't be able to scare you at this point. You should be plenty afraid. Uh, and we're going to augment that. So, uh, welcome, Mike. And uh, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you, uh, you know, take take the opening round on how you want to. Hey, thank you, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, as many of you may or may not know, uh, ran a hedge fund for a long time, predominantly in healthcare, uh, and uh, been running money for the past twenty years. And I currently run the uh, Pink Fund. Ooh, I can if I lift my left hand because it's all reversed. There it is. There it is. It's up there. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, that, and the proceeds from that, the fees and my compensation goes to the uh, Susan Coleman Foundation for Breast Cancer. And I'm not allowed to disclose the performance of the Pink Fund, but you can take a look at it yourself. Or Keith, you could even comment on it uh, versus the MSCI Healthcare Benchmark. Yeah, um, it looks good. It looks good. And, and it's, it's, it's not as nice as your, your red jacket. And a lot of people that saw you at... Hedge Eye Live are quite fond of that, and you took out a, a, which many will remember, by the way, and I'm sure you can remind them of the date. What what uh, Taylor did was he took a piece of toilet paper out of the jacket, and gave a long, long list. And and this was long before many people didn't realize things were going to blow up um, on all the different things. Mike, is the list longer now or is it shorter? It's longer. Yeah. It's longer now uh, because, and this is what always happens when you have a, uh, a breakdown and beginning of the breakdown in capital markets where uh, things go wrong and then you discover new things upon the things that went wrong, things that you didn't know or didn't quite understand. And I'll throw a for instance out there, uh, the vast majority of home loans in the UK are uh, three to five year bubble loans or balloon loans, if you will. And so they have to refi their housing market at about 18% every year, mm. meaning they have to refi 18% of the float every year for Lovely. the next three years. And that's, that's just good. my back of the envelope calculation is that the refi rates in uh, the UK are two to three times the previous rates uh, so for most of these people that financed in 17. So it's a, I mean, a lot of people actually, I didn't know that, that part. I do know the Canadian part where your rate's floating. So you can't just get like a jumbo loan on a fixed rate. Um, you know, a lot of markets are, are really in, in, in tough shape, particularly ca uh, capital markets on the high yield and credit side, European, UK, USA, fully loaded. Uh, what part of that, like, let's maybe just go there because you used, um, you actually used credit first. And a lot of people are probably thinking crypto and equities, which we'll get to. Um, but, you know, what, are, what about the credit bubble, you know, that's really kind of wrapped inside of all this? Well, I mean, as you know, we've had extreme low rates with the help of quantitative easing uh, for a decade, more than a decade. And we've had a cumulative build of uh, credit everywhere. And a lot of it is in the process of blowing up. And it, it's blowing up in the regard, a classic regard, margins. Uh, because of the green movement, we've had a very long, over decade long underinvestment in materials and energy, but the demand has remained uh, inelastic. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it gets pretty classical where you have supply not meeting demand. I mean, the probability that we're going to have a decline in energy or a flattening in energy demand at any point year on year would also predict a great global depression. So the probability of that happening is very, very low. So the probability of the cost of these materials going up is extremely high. And you're seeing some of the consequences of this 
in, for instance, China, where you have had a massive multi-decade long malinvestment in order to keep their wheels moving along the line of uh, not only industry, but housing and predominantly housing has been the vehicle, CapEx, long duration builds. And it is in the process right now, it is blowing up, blowing up to the degree where this is exactly what happened in the U.S. in 07, 08, 09 is where they stopped paying their mortgages and said, fine, take the property. Or in the case of China, they're paying mortgages for properties that they may or may not ever receive. In, in China, they buy all these properties up front before they're even built. And so you get the financing, you're paying the mortgage, and uh, essentially every single builder in China has worked away or stolen all of their working capital so that they don't have the funding to build a property that people already bought. Mm. And, and honestly, people don't even want delivery now. No, that's a ch- ch- unwind the whole thing. Hey there, Hedgeye Nation, or if you're not part of Hedgeye Nation, thanks for watching Hedgeye on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to click on the button below there. Subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also follow the link in the description to our website to get even more great investing content. The Chinese piece, like of, of all the things, like in my framework that had easy comps because it's been screwed up for longer, is how the math works on China, uh, <laughs> and and they got you know they're clearly at the wrong, on the wrong side of the trade from a demographic perspective, a debt perspective, deficit perspective, anything that they're willing to admit, which isn't much. Um, but I, I found, uh, you know, again, the data against easy comps, you know somebody's screwed when they have easy comps or easy base effects, and the data's slowing faster as the base effects ease. For those of you that don't know what that means, everyone on the buy side does. Um, but I thought, Mike, like earlier in the week, one of the worst numbers we've seen, and we're gonna see a lot of zeros in global macro data, like 0% growth or negative growth, uh, 0% import growth for the month of August out of China. That, that was okay. I mean, that's, that's um, a somewhat true number relative to the other numbers they make up, but that is such an alarmingly negative number when you think about like a global quad four setup instead of just a US one or just a local European one. Americans have great difficulty in understanding a uh, command economy because we just, First of all, all command economies were essentially fringe economies until China happened. And we essentially allowed them to uh, put wealth in their currency uh, or value in their currency by having them export their labor uh, largely to us and Europe. And, And so that they've had value built in their currency. And with that, they built a gigantic house of cards. And that house of cards is now in the process of failing. Uh, At the same time though, which is stunning, they have a massive inflationary problem. And I believe that the shutdowns of the cities, and this is a bit controversial, but as you know, I know uh, COVID pretty well. Um, China's had a massive COVID problem right from the start. And it is inconceivable that it is now that they're shutting down cities and so forth in order to curb the spread of COVID. That is very unlikely what they're actually doing. What they're actually doing is trying to curb inflation because they can blame COVID on the Americans. They can't blame inflation on anyone but themselves. And you have to remember in a command economy where essentially all the assets of the state, including the people, are owned by the state. The name of the game is control. And so they must have a narrative that works. And the one that works is, oh, COVID is the big problem. We're shutting things down Mm. in order to prevent COVID spread. That's not, in my view, what's happening. In my view, they are trying to prevent inflation uh, and, and that being reflected upon the Communist Party as their problem and their fault. And, and they're being successful at that. Uh, of course, at the same time, they're destroying their economy, which they probably don't have a choice either way on, on that outcome. So there's usually when these things happen, things off menu events happen. And that's kind of what I'm looking for in Europe and in China and many other places, El Salvador, so many countries. I expect meaningful off-menu events to happen in the next eight months to a year, and and maybe sooner, between food, energy, materials, 
the cost of capital. I mean, all of these things are happening all at the same time in a global fashion. Um, and, and it sort of sets up when you look at the, the best proxy people might point to is 08, okay? 08 was a very, very, very US problem. And it, believe it or not, it was localized yeah. compared to what's going on now. Uh, we've broken, there is a lot of China being broken by the elephant in the China shop right now. And things are going to very likely break badly and painfully. Yeah, it's um, 08 is, again, most people don't get it right heading into what we call a quad four market crash and or recession. You can have either, by the way. You can have a crash, uh, short term market crash that the Fed then eases into, which guys like Mike T and I now know how to trade after doing multiple, uh, you know, multiple reps on that. Or you go into the real. I'm trading right now. (laughs) I swear to God, I opened my mouth up and the market just freaking tanked. Well, you should. I mean, this thing was a uh, business here. This is a full time job, guys. Okay? Well, you you, you trade because I was front running you. I made sales right before the show uh, only because uh-huh. only I had to. Uh, but 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 in, in all seriousness, I think when when people go back and they look, well, it's not that I didn't call that, but it's definitely not that. OK, well, thanks. Uh, Tom Lee's going to tell me what it wasn't when he didn't call any of them. OK, oh, well, he's going to tell me it's 1982. OK, it's 1982. OK, Tom, that's the latest talking point. Uh, not to pick on Tom. I, don't, I, never, I never call people up by name. Uh, but, but seriously, it, every single market crash is born out of the current behavior that is new to this cycle. You know, there's a rhythm and rhyme, obviously, to Quad 4, growth and inflation and corporate profits slowing into a recession at the same time. That's what Quad 4 is. Um, but there's absolutely no similarity between 2008 and the crash that Mike Taylor and I are talking about. This, Mike, I think, in particular, if you lop, lop on the main street that is the main street in Europe or the main street in El Salvador, I mean, nice call guys going to the crypto on time, uh, or the, the, the main street uh, anywhere. This is a main street concentric bubble crash from China to El Salvador to the biggest retail buying bubble, uh, well eclipsing you know, $3 trillion in market cap crypto did, did I think, in the dot-bomb bubble. With, with no commissions. By the way, back then you had to pay a commission, I think, to get into the bubble. Uh, and you had to be, and honestly, to trade in options markets, you had to be a baller. Now you just yeah. need to click a thing and be like, okay, now I can trade options. And that's it. <laughs> Great I mean, that's point. essentially every Robinhood client. So yeah. it, it is, and I hate like the glom on and say, oh, it's just two guys shit canning the market. Beep. Okay, beep that out. But we are crapping all over the market for a very, very good reason. Uh, This is the worst setup I have ever seen coming into stocks. And I said it in November coming into 2022, and I've said it all year. And let's just say that I'm up triple digits on the year. That'll work. And and you're going to be up more, more triple digits if we collapse from here. Um, yes. could, we, could we go through um, on the short term tactical on what you and I spend basically most of our time talking about? I don't think that there's any fundamental debate about global quad four. I really don't. You know, when people say, well, where you can be wrong. I don't think I don't think that the risk is being wrong there. In fact, I always say that the risk of being wrong fundamentally is that we're not bearish enough. Um, where you can be wrong is, you know, in the short term is with these flow issues that are squarely in the hedge fund business. Can we talk quickly about that? For example, yesterday's bounce, first day in seven or eight or whatever it was for the NASDAQ, was very obviously led by Goldman's most short basket, the worst 12-month loser basket, you're a loser basket, whatever basket you know, led the rally. Apple was up 10 basis points this morning after you know, unveiling what everybody is already going to know. So c- can you talk about the flow and how some people might be sitting there saying, holy shit, man, I got to cover my shorts because if I didn't do that in June, I'm going to like lose it for another six weeks, where, whereas you might just only have to lose it for like another six hours of trading. This is where there's so much money to be made, an ungodly amount of weak hands at the hedge funds and retail. Yeah, it's both they're, they're, ways. They're actually look this, like the same thing, by the way, right now. No it, offense. It, to it, is, it is. There's, and, and I've had to modify the way that I trade uh, and be a little bit more nimble about it because uh, I've been of the mindset for this year is I don't care what they do. Everything's going lower, a lot lower. And I've changed that to 
actually trade these inflections. And I don't normally do that. I don't do it because I usually don't have to, but there's just so much money to be made on trading both sides that for Hedgeye and your clients, this is really an ideal condition to be nimble and active. Um, and it's, it's really because retail is playing such a huge role and hedge funds are on their heels and they only know how to make money from the long side. So the, they are very, very trigger finger to take all the shorts off as fast as they can. Yeah. And by the way, the vast majority of them are all down horribly. So what you have to look at, and, and you didn't bring it up, and there's nothing wrong with it, you didn't, because I've been researching what is the absolute lead indicator of a day-to-day -day trade and what the tape is going to do. And working with some of my allocator friends who, you know, we're talking guys that allocate hundreds of billions of dollars of hedge fund money. And so they are working with me. And, and it's a great spot to be in because I don't run a hedge fund now, so I have no book to talk. I'm not talking my book, so I can be a really good friend to them. And uh, triangulation has brought us to <laughs> drum roll. I'll get my wand out. Just, you know, we got it out now. Okay? It is five-year investment grade CDS Ooh. is the lead indicator for almost every single day of trading. If CDS go down, market will go up. CDS go up, market will go down. And that has what it's been playing that for almost the entire, well, yeah, the entire year. And that is lead indicator. And, and what I'll, I'll point out to, for instance, we just had a rally here, uh, a little one, you know, like, yes, you still want to short the piss out of Netflix, but <laughs> leverage loans did not participate with this market. Yesterday, high yield was up strong on a bounce. Uh, IG CDS sold off. That's investment grade CDS, five-year CDS, what we just talked about. And leverage loans didn't move at all. So you have these like incredible dichotomous movements that should be correlated, but they're not. Right. And in addition, I have been called, well, I've been called many things, but I've been called on the phone <laughs> a lot as of late in the past three weeks by the debt guys. And they're saying, what the hell is going on with stocks? Globally, bonds are selling off and stocks are not down remotely as much as they should be. And, and so you're seeing kind of this breakdown of models. And whenever I see breakdowns, even for a short period of time where correlations are not in sync, and that's what we're seeing right now, I step back and I say, well, what is different? Well, what is different is that we don't have jobless claims up. OK, like we probably normally would at this point. In fact, jobless claims just turned over and started going down. And that's probably because of the crypto bros coming back to work. <laughs> that's what I really think it is. is that all these guys have to get a second job because apparently trading as a second job isn't a good trade. Mm. And then um, uh, next, next, uh, where, where they're complaining about the, uh, the movement here is um, the new money that has come in from retail. And I think that's what they're underestimating is the persistent dip buying. Now, observe this though, the dip buying is getting weaker and weaker and weaker yeah. as their ammo gets all used up. And I think that that is where the disconnect between bonds and stocks are well, and it will run out and where it really runs out is when the jobless claims start to go soft because we are going to have quantitative tightening ongoing at 90 billion a month uh, a fracturing credit market globally a, a three alarm energy crisis and consumption crisis in europe in my view the uk is going to be the worst and and as I said, jobless claims and U.S. consumption going down. It's like a quad, fair, quad four cubed event. Uh, and we're going to have this lag time where I'll get the wand out again. Sorry. Like and it. we're going to have this lag. We're going to have this lag time. And the lag time is where the Fed can't pivot. That's the problem. They can't pivot. They're going to have to stay on course. Uh, it reminds me of the Death Star scene, you know, where the guy's on there and he's got the mask on. He goes, stay on target, stay on target, stay. And then he gets killed by Death, Darth Vader or something. 
because he just can't get off course. And so we're going to have this period of time where we have tightening conditions and an, a very quickly ailing economy. And well, that, that part I want to I want to because you've done more work on the on the timing of QT. You know, Steiner on my on my team has done a bunch of it, too. But I want to hear people. I want I want to let people hear your view of QT and what this means in context. But before we do that, like of everything he just said before he took a sip of whatever he took a sip of, you know, you, when you talk about cubed or three, anything three dimensional, whatever you're doing, like if you're sitting there like a retail investor looking at a 50 day single factor moving monkey, okay? You're the monkey, right? So again, there are a lot of people out there that have no idea what they're doing, have no idea what Michael just said. And when I call him Michael, it's getting serious, okay? So let's look at a couple things. He said that, well, the retail, the retail buying's getting less serious. Look at yesterday's volume during the rally, Mike. It was down 16 and 18%, guys, if you could show this morning's from the I'm sorry, show. Keith, there's a two word sentence for that, a shit sandwich. <laughs> Well, I, I, I call that like when a, when a hockey player that I coach passes one of those up the wall, I call that a shit burger. But I mean, that's what that was yesterday. On yesterday's glorious rally, which was largely driven by hedge fund short covering, panic short covering and the lowest of quality crap. I mean, that's what you had. So that's one thing Mike just said. That's a really important point. Uh, another thing that he said was the lack of correlation across asset classes. Now, Mike, it wasn't just that. It was in stocks globally. Like, the NASDAQ went up the moon yesterday, or the S&P was up almost uh, 2%. And look what the Hang Seng did. It opened, down, it opened down and closed down on the lows and continues to crash. So that's, there's your picture of what the Chinese really think. I mean, and look at the third picture that Mike hit on. Five-year CDS, one of the most important charts that I look at when I get up in the morning. I don't get up at 4.30 in the morning to, to read somebody's bullshit narrative. Uh, I, I, I do the work. I mean, look at five years, uh, slide 141, guys. Ital this, I think, Mike, is the epicenter of the five-year CDSs, which is the Italian one. Look at this, baby. This thing is not good, okay? So Italian yeah. five-year CDS, if you believe, and let's do Europe maybe right now before we do QT. We got to hit both of those topics. Um, but this is the epicenter of the European problem, Italy. Okay, Italy, and if you and if you understand that the number one factor to watch on a live on a live tick is that five-year CDS, and you think it's just USA, you're not looking at it the right way. You got to look at it cubed. You got to look at it on a multi-factor, multi-duration basis. I agree entirely, and I encourage everybody when you get up in the morning, you look at the CDS. We're going to be right back to this game again, and, and I mean the game again that you and I endured uh, back in '08. Yeah, I mean, do you remember that when we started out? I mean, with our first really, really big crisis, I didn't even know what a CDS was. <laughs> I didn't either. I didn't either. And, and you know what? You know who CDS? Don't tell anybody, but our buddies that used to work at Credit Suisse, because a lot of them left because they got paid. Look yes. At, look at Credit yes. Suisse's CDS relative to 08. So it's not like Wall Street doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have any issues this time. We just said that it's bigger than that. So one of the problems that I anticipate that's going to occur, uh, and it happens almost every time when you have real um, input problems and inflationary problems, is that the governments will make more money because that's what the voters want. If things cost too much, you simply give them more money, even though that exacerbates the problem. And we just saw the beginnings of that in Europe where they're, they have an energy crisis, but the UK came out and said, we're gonna cap energy prices to the households, all of them, to what is it, 2,500 pounds a year, which is still about three X what they were paying, but they're gonna cap that. Okay. And so I have a great business proposition for you, Keith. If they're gonna cap the energy prices at 2,500 pounds a year, can we just start open up Bitcoin farms in the UK because the energy prices are capped. You can burn all you want. Yeah, they sure. literally don't have a plan to offset that. It's just we're going into total panic mode uh, where the consumer and the government are going to shoulder wild, huge costs. And uh, I had a call last night with a, a number of probably your viewers that are out here. It was a Twitter spaces call and I haven't been on any of these for a while, but uh, we went through the, uh, the UK setup and, and how this is going to play out. And I'm still trying to figure out how to play it correctly. I don't have the right name yet. 
I mean, there's Burberry, there's, you know, um, there's just not, I don't know if any of your listeners in the Q and A can throw me up some ideas on how to play the UK other than uh, short the pound. I got one. I got a good one. My, uh, my, uh, he's not a rookie anymore, but uh, Ryan Ritchie, uh, one day on the macro show goes, you know what, Mucker? You know who's got the most exposure to Europe? Like 40%? The Fang. Oh, yeah, I got that. <laughs> Check. <laughs> I'm pulling sometimes out the... it's a, hey, sometimes it's a lot easier than going to find a super, you know, a, a, like obviously a lot of stocks are going to collapse and we're short the pound too, but I, I don't think a lot of people think about that, but they will be thinking about that. I mean, it's one thing for Microsoft to initially guide down on FX. Well, if you're guiding down before on FX, what are you going to do now? CFO just sold like 20 million bucks worth of stock. Um, but you're going to hear more and more and more and more about this from these mega caps that could do no, no wrong. These are bubble caps, of course, not mega caps, which is all part of the biggest uh, bubble in capital market history. Investors need to understand what's happening in Europe, too, uh, because we're so U.S. centric. We don't think about the, uh, the impact. And I know it's not in the news anymore, but apparently there's a meaningful war going on in Europe. <laughs> and you should take note uh, because Putin's Putin's game is uh, a I exit in a pine box. B I strangle Europe so bad that it begins to fracture, and yep. so he is gunning on B. There's no peace deal. There's none. It's not going to happen. And the, my view, the probability of at the end of winter or during the winter that we see a major escalation. Uh, in defending Europe and so forth is extremely high. And just walk with me through the game theory here. Uh, number one, we could point to history in, uh, in, in negotiating with a dictator, uh, central terrorist, a truly bad guy. Um, Neville Chamberlain had a uh, miserable deal with Hitler that was immediately dishonored. And all of the leaders of Europe are between 60 and 75 years old. So they all remember Neville Chamberlain and the story of how World War II transpired. And so the probability of them wanting to negotiate with, uh, with Putin is unlikely. Uh, number two, there's the war machine. And the war machine would love to get paid by an escalation. And then lastly is the voters. If the politicians are willing to cave and, and basically give Putin what he wants, which might be a whole lot, um, they're probably going to lose their seat in office. But if they escalate uh, and create a big distract, distraction, because they're going to have a miserable economy, an energy crisis, and I mean really miserable economy, uh, war and, and an escalation is a really nice political out uh, to rally around the leaders. And so I think it might be convenient for them to escalate. And, and I'm sad to say it. I'm just trying to think through it very, very logically and say, it's not what I want to happen. Forget what I want to happen. Being right is for people who write books. We are here to make money. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. That's what I think is probably going to happen. You know, I had a, because I don't know anything about anything, but I do uh, from time to time think about some questions to ask people that do. And um, Colonel McCausland, who's one of the guys that we have in D.C. who would know more about this than I, obviously the former dean of the um, U.S. Military War College, he, he said, I said, okay, look, what happens if Putin dies? Because I was worried back then, uh, Mike, about like getting squeezed, because I'm like, okay, I'm short all this stuff. It's April, May, June, whatever. Uh, that, could, that could really you know, be a lot of pain for me. And uh, he said, no, oh, no, no, no. That would be worse. If, if Putin dies, you know who his, the other guys are? You know, they're worse. <laughs> and I was like, what? Um, yeah, so I, I do think that it's like an interesting setup in terms of like the long game there. The other thing that McCausland always says, I say, if there's one thing that's wrong in terms of mainstream media and what they say, what is it about this war in Europe, he's like, oh, that it's going to end soon. You know, so, you know, this is, you know, you can have a long-term tail on, if you guys can show quad four globally on slide 20, like Europe, we have it currently, you know, four quad fours in a row, but, but Mike, this could last much longer than a year. I mean, that, that's four quarters obviously equals a year. Uh, and by the way, at the bottom there, where you can see the U.S. quads, because Europe and USA are both, you know, screwed in quad terms, 
Um, that's the first time that the USA has had four straight quad fours, Mike, since the, coming out of the 1999-2000 bubble, growth bubble, because you need a big bubble of comps to, to stay slow for longer. Uh, and it's also the last time the yield curve was this inverted. So methinks that we found a lot of things that, 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 that you should be grizzly bearish about. I don't disagree. Uh, so far as my book, Helm's set up, um, I, I How short have... are you right now? Hold on, I'll tell you. This guy goes I'm crazy. About, short. Uh, not as short as I was. I'm about, I'm probably about 60% net right now, short. And when you say uh, net, can you, I, can you explain to people like you're, because you dealt it just, you, you use a lot of options too. Can you explain that quickly? Uh, yes. Um, uh, for instance, 60% uh, net short for me would be I have $100 million in longs on and $160 million in shorts. Good. And so I'd be about net $60 million short versus my equity position equity being the long portion of my book, $100 million. And your and longs, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've been, you've been long energy? I am long a little bit of energy, uh, but it's mostly in uh, options. Okay. Um, and I have, and, and really that's kind of one of my hedges uh, in case China decides to, oh, we need to grow now. Uh, it's a we have a real supply problem on the energy front, and that's a different call. But if we have any pivot anywhere in any way, uh, energy is going to go parabolic. And so I kind of have a trigger there uh, for that. In addition, there are certain areas like coal and so forth that are going to have sort of uh, organic demand that, uh, that, that that's unavoidable. And most of these companies are literally trading at two and three times their earnings. Yeah. So uh, they're generating, going to generate a whole bunch of um, of cash. Uh, so how I'm set up, uh, I'm long uh, med tech. I'm I'm long pink. Uh, I'm size, and um, and I should be. Heck, I run it. And <laughs> well, I mean, but, but you should also be uh, slide um, eight, guys. You should be healthcare is a quad four net long. So it is a place where. Even if he didn't do healthcare, it just turns out that he's one of the best at it. Uh, that you would have healthcare on the board as a sector style. Utilities is our favorite, but uh, obviously there are plenty of healthcare stocks that are signaling bullish trade and trend despite the bear market. Well, I draw your attention to probably the biggest spread that I've seen in my career in healthcare. In fact, it is the biggest spread I've ever seen in my career in such a macro sense. It is uh, uh, the drug stocks versus med tech. Ah, yeah. Med tech is like, you know, companies that put uh, hips and knees and things into you in the hospital setting. And pharma, of course, sell biotech drugs and pills. Uh, but uh, med tech has underperformed pharma by about 40% spread this year, meaning uh, med tech has underperformed pharma by about 40% in, in gross. And that is a number that is just absolutely astonishing. And there's some reasons for it uh, because of COVID, uh, the hospitals got gutted and the workers have left and just can't, couldn't stand it anymore. And so they had a staffing problem. At the same time, all the med tech companies had an increase in cost to all their hips and knees and things like that. And it was a cost that they couldn't pass on to the hospitals. All these prices are fixed. They don't have pricing power. But all of those comps now are behind us. And so from here, from a 40% down versus pharma, I think, I believe that uh, MedTech is going to be the very, very, very big winner, relatively speaking, for the remainder of the year and well into next year. And so I have a disproportionately long MedTech position on, and you can see some of my positioning if you look at the pink fund, and uh, that reports like every day what the positions are. So you can drill down into that and see what sort of alpha names that I really like in there. But overall, I'm uh, more bullish med tech than I am pharma overall in healthcare. I think that spread is going to get uh, closed out. And so I see meaningful outperformance in the med tech arena over the next year. And that's actually one of the very, very, very few places anywhere in the world where I can find easy comps that are going to beat expectations for an entire group yeah. for the next year. 
And so that's really exciting to me because I can be long that versus um, Apple computer. Right. Remember, Apple sells products in Europe. I just, you, you should write that down, okay? <laughs> oh, great. And, uh, they're going to sell, they're going to sell Europeans in dollars an $800 watch now so they can go climb the Himalayas. It's a really good idea going into recession. Well, there might be a lot of people climbing because uh, I, I hear that uh, throwing yourself off the top of that mountain is actually a relief. So <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> oh, uh, it, it might be a busy watch sale season. Uh, I shouldn't laugh about that. I'll, no. I'll take it all back no. now. This is this is why compliance gets mad at me. So um, what else can I say that I have on here? And then net net, I'm short materially uh, and and I'm short things that like you can, would make sense. of. I have a huge list and I like to say it. Uh, the the huge list of companies that have a date with Dr. Zero and the, the number of companies I I've never seen anything like it. Are you willing to talk, to talk about your like top three zeros, even if you rattle them off? I just shorted one. It's Fubo. Uh, we think that's going to zero. Yeah, Fubo goes to zero. Roku, maybe. I'm just thinking things in that in that realm. Uh, Peloton very likely goes to zero. Bed Bath & Beyond absolutely goes to zero. Beyond Meat goes to zero. Uh, a little uh, plastics recycling company called Danamer uh, very likely goes to zero. Uh, oh, wait, I could just turn around and look at my list here. <laughs> <laughs> Dave with Dr. Zero. Oh, oh, I did? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we got Coinbase. Like, Coinbase, uh, MSTR, I, I think Bitcoin is going to be way below $10,000 when this is all said and done. And, and we're, we're, MSTR is finished. And all the, all the makings of this are happening now. The CEO, who is the voice of this, has stepped down. I, you know, I, it's, well, it's, yeah, all, yeah. it's all happening. But, but Coinbase it, it, doesn't it, it, make any money. On, they lose money on their core business. And the SEC has come out and said Coinbase shouldn't be trading 80% of the crap that they're trading because it's unregistered securities. Like, is that going to come down and actually have a role in this company? Absolutely. In addition, Citadel is coming into their trading market, which is going to destroy the spreads. And that's been what's kept them up to begin with. So you have diminishing uh, uh, revenue line just based on the number of coins that they're going to be involved in, and then crashing margins for a company that doesn't make any money anyway, ever. Well, it did have that two quarters where it did. But, <laughs> you know, I... I and, and look, this is the stuff that retail owns. They love this crap. I don't exactly know why. It's probably because, you know, they don't know finance and they don't know that numbers actually matter, especially when you have quantitative tightening. The yeah, cost that, of capital matters. Let's get into that because, you know, I was going to say, you know, in defense of Michael Saylor, he can't run the company because he has to def defend tax evasion now, so he's busy. Uh, you have a lot of... Um, you, you know, I don't know if he did it or not, but I'll just you know, take the headlines word for it that he's going to be busy with that. But that notwithstanding, this, the, all these types of behaviors, you know, the fraud at Celsius, the fraud broadly in crypto, uh, the tattoos on the arms, the zero at Luna, you know, it, this is what happens in bubbles. Now, can you just t tie it to QT? Because most, the Fed does not take responsibility for creating the crypto bubble. Why, what did they have to do with it? Uh, you know, the, the Fed doesn't take, w will not take any responsibility in, crea in creating any of the credit bubbles, equity market bubbles, uh, meme stock bubbles, SPAC bubbles, you know, but, but didn't QE have something to do with that? And, and QT is the opposite. Look, as you know, no matter what the Fed says, they have one job, and that is to finance the Treasury and to make sure that the government can borrow money at a rate that is appropriate. And that rate that is appropriate is probably around 2%. That's what they can muster. And so in my view, the central bank has very little choice but to tank the economy until there is a spot on the yield curve where the government can fund itself. Yep. You've said and, this and that's it because a very good point. If, if you take a step back and you look at the components of GDP, well, we're growing. Well, what does growth mean? Well, I'll tell your viewers what growth means, what it really means when you peel away the onion and you say, what are the components of growth? For the past decade, our government has been wildly overspending and creating all of the growth in our GDP. So if we have 3% growth in GDP, 5% of it is the government overspending 
by 5%. Uh, it's actually a lot more than that, but let's just say by 5%. And if they walked in and had a balanced budget at any one day, we would be in a minimum negative 2% year on year, uh, not even, it would be worse than that, but let's say at least 2% negative GDP growth situation. And the, the cascading problem is that the Fed is very worried about and why they're trying to walk this fine line and not tanking the economy too bad is the tax receipts. If they come into a situation where tax receipts are down uh, too bad, uh, they are going to have, they're going to have to borrow more money to keep the spending largesse afloat. And borrowing more money for the U.S. means we have to find international buyers who want to buy more and more and more. They're going to demand a higher price. And right. that's sort of the doom loop that they are very, very worried about. These are the things that they actually worry about that they do not talk about on television. And they are very tightly tied to the White House and to the Treasury, trying to formulate a plan to uh, meet all the ends with a soft landing, getting yields down to a certain point without crashing the economy so that we can come out of it, just kind of eke our way out of it. Because unlike Japan, we can't turn on the printing press because too much of our debt is owned overseas. Mm -hmm. Everyone will sell it if we if we turned around and did that and let inflation go willy nilly like Japan just has. I mean, take a look at the yen. I mean, this is incredible with the J Japanese oh, imports. Minor move. What they are doing to their public. I mean, every single just yen adjusted import prices for everything just on the currency alone are up thirty percent. I mean, this is incredible for an for a whole, the entire society where half of them are on a fixed income. I mean, this is truly torture for these people. And what is the central bank? They don't care. They don't, they, they do not care. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is to keep the bubble alive. Mm -hmm. That's it. And they don't care if the, the senior citizens are eating dog food, don't care. And so whenever you hear our Fed saying that they care, they don't care. They never care. It is all about controlling the message and allowing the people to be fooled. And that is their job. Well, that's um, and isn't that an understatement? You know, really. I mean, you know, to, to to really prey on the ignorance of the people. I mean, I I was you know rather disgusted listening to Powell as I will be you know, again today. He's talking about the nobility almost and being a monetary analyst, like and, and having to get it right. You know, Powell, you got it so wrong on inflation, and now you're going to get it so wrong on recession risk. You, you, it's just like a joke uh, that we're all clinging to what an unelected central planner has to say about all this when he has no competence, you know, anal analyzing his way out outside of the bathroom door. Um, but uh, just what, uh, and by the way, if people have questions. If you have questions, questions are getting voted up or down for Mike, um, and we'll go to those next. But, but again, QT, can you talk about the, the, the lack of, of what they did versus what now they, I don't know if they, they have to do it, but you know, what you think about that window of QT before we get to the other side, which you just articulated. So QT, as I like to say, is the gigantic sucking sound. And it is a seller that walks into the market who is relentless and doesn't care what the price is. And that's exactly what quantitative tightening is. As $90 billion of items mature or don't mature on their balance sheet, they are going to be exiting $90 billion of stuff off of their balance sheet every month. And the white paper that's out there says they plan on doing it for three years. Now, I don't think they're going to do it for three years, but up until, I don't know, the middle of this summer, the public thought that pretty much it wasn't going to happen at all. And they are aware of the excesses out there. Uh, that's not what they're actually trading on to try to correct it. They're actually trying to get interest rates down in a global fashion so that they can float the treasury. That's really the goal. But that giant sucking sound is a huge problem. Think of it like this. Powell is the maintenance guy, okay? He's the maintenance guy with the tool belt and he's working at Hoover Dam. And the government just keeps pouring more and more and more water into the reservoir. And the dam's cracking. And they're like, hey, Pauly, will you get down there and fix that crack? And that's what he's doing. He's walking around. He's a crack fixer. That's what he's doing. He's trying to clean up their mess. 
He is their mess. He's a diaper changer. That's what he's doing. And they are just going to abuse the crap out of him because his job is to clean up their mess and they will not change. I mean, look at the Japanese legislature, look at Europe, look at Brussels, look at China, look at the US. These politicians will abuse their situation until well beyond it breaks. And then we end up having a new monetary regime, which may be the end consequence of this. And I don't know what that's going to look like yet, but we're in the point of a lot of cracks and things go wrong. Yeah, anybody, uh, and anybody, it's probably going to be a lot of things going wrong at the same time. Anybody who starts with some bullshit valuation answer to that question, please go back to watching CNBC. I mean, really. I mean, uh, honestly, you can do that when jobless claims uh, basically start lifting by 50, 75, 100 bips. At that point, the Fed may feel a pivot. They're going to pivot and uh, taper down quantitative yeah, but, 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 but regardless, I mean, the, when the Fed pivoted in, at, on this day, you could pick this day in 2008. Was that a buy signal? No. I mean, the Fed had well, well right. past pivoted and had been like, forget poopy poopy in the pal pants or the crack man that you just called him. Uh, you, had, you had Bernanke and Paulson with the bazooka, and that still didn't work. Sucked in Buffett in October of 08. You know, you can go back to 2000, 2001 when Greenspan pivoted. That wasn't a buy signal. I think that that's yes. a big thing. When I talk to our institutional clients, Mike, that's the number one thing, and it's generally because I'm talking to analysts that weren't here for either of those cycles and certainly didn't have bosses that called them at hedge funds because a lot of those ones went away. You know, they, they're like, oh, really? When, when Fed go cowbell and rate go down, I don't buy tech? Not entering a recession, you don't. Absolutely not if the last two recessions are any leading indicator. And I agree. I was just trying to answer the question as to when you start to look at valuation. Right. Oh, yeah. And that yeah. is the day you start. What? Uh, as, but so far as actually going all in because they pivot, no, that is usually the beginning of bad, bad, that bad things happening. Right. Because the momentum is already there for businesses shutting down and dropping off people. By the way, that has already started uh, my contacts in the field uh, in, in every space. Uh, especially around the housing market, which is a gigantic input for the U.S. Yeah. on a relative basis. Uh, and it has started badly. Uh, essentially, every single builder who did flipping and spec homes uh, over the past year is underwater badly on everything they did. Between the cogs that is in it, the property that was overvalued, and all of it was because of modern monetary theory. Look, if you give people a trillion dollars in their pocket, they're going to bid everything to the moon. And, and we're, we're in that hangover spot. But there was a lot of development that went into the ground at much, much, much higher prices. And the correction that has to happen, right now we're in the, oh, I'm just waiting. But uh, essentially all of this flipping market is funded by hard money. And the hard money, if you're good, is 20% a year. So yep. you have a 20% theta for all this crap that's sitting on the shelf. Uh, and, and come winter, come spring next year, we're going to have, I believe, forced sales uh, everywhere. And I will be a buyer, but I'm in a different category because um, I can. I can do that. But yeah, that's different. But, uh, but, but that's, that's different. Yeah, I'm looking for distressed, distressed sellers. I think we're going to come into a realm where we have distressed sellers. Uh, I should also talk about my biggest position uh, that I am long. I'm long uh, PCT. Mm -hmm. And I've been longer for a long time, uh, Pure Cycle. Um, Technologies. Uh, let me get my hat. All right, there we go. All right. So, Pure Cycle <laughs> is absolutely killing it on execution. Uh, they're finishing up their first plant uh, to recycle. Uh, really, don't think of this as a plastics recycling company that makes polypropylene. Think of it as a plastics manufacturing company. But it's a manufacturing company with inelastic demand. Uh, a monopoly and pricing power. And when they start producing uh, this, it'll be the end of this year. They're probably going to have margins that are minimum three to four X the, pla the other plastics makers that actually manufacture it from oil. So uh, to this, it should be this week or next week, but it's in days where they're going to finish their project financing for about $750 million. Uh, and, and this is a small stock, 1.6 billion, and it'll be for their first very, very, very large plant in Georgia, uh, which 
I am going to this weekend. Surprise, PCT, I'm coming by. Exciting. <laughs> the old channel and, uh, check. And and so I, I I'm that is my biggest long. It's 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 one of the it's really one of the best opportunities that I've seen. I usually get about five to seven really big ideas over a decade, and this is this is a very very big one. Um, you know, doing fifty to sixty seventy percent margins in Europe. These are EBITDA margins. This will be the most profitable plastics maker maker by a country mile in the world, with a monopoly on the IT uh, IP rather and. And, and really an elastic demand for the only recycled polypropylene that can be used in food, packaging, medical, and on and on and on. So yeah. I expect a heck of a lot more from them. And, um, and, and look at it like this, what the comps trade at, uh, you can, after this first plan is up, you can start modeling it. Uh, and the vanilla investors will. And this will get moved up into the Russell 2000 benchmark sizably. And when the vanillas see this and find out what it is, they're going to have to buy the piss out of this thing. And there is no float. I mean, I know personally probably 70% of the shareholders that are there because there's literally 15 people that own the stock in, in, in its totality. So it is very thin. And it's just set up for a meaningful move. And, and my sort of like, what's your price target, Mike Taylor? I think this is gonna go from 1.6 billion market cap to 40 billion. And it might be more than that because Europe is just so profitable. Hmm. Uh, and that's really around taxation or on plastic. But we could go into it for hours and hours and hours, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that as my top position. And I've taken my lumps in it, but I can. I run a hedged book. And so there would be at some point during this crashy period where I, I and I'm about 75 percent invested. I still have room to get more. And I've just been holding off and waiting for uh, that crisis moment where everyone hates stocks. And honestly, I hope it comes. Well, we certainly I mean, uh, people that don't know how to invest long term, like when you say over the course of your career, you know, once we get into the 30th year or whatever it's going to be, Mike, and you say I get one of the, you know, I get five or 10 of these in my life. You know, people that blew up in the SPAC bubble, one, they don't know how to risk manage money. Two, all they look is for stock picks from Motley Tool or wherever. They just don't know what they're doing. But the stock went down with a bunch of SPACs. And now it's actually gone back to bullish trade and trend, which I did not know because I haven't looked at it in a while, um, after all that happened. So now what? I mean, it's, it just looks better. And you stayed with it because you're an investor in the company. You're going to go see it again. So I appreciate that. I mean, not a lot of people actually stay with their positions because a lot of people work at hedge funds, too, that aren't allowed to. Mike is allowed to. He did really well for a long period of time and afforded himself that opportunity. So again, we, there's a lot that you can learn here, but running a hedged book is a big part of it. Now, on these questions, you may or may not be surprised at what the number one question is, Mike. And this does speak, and I don't want to be critical of anybody out there, but it does speak to what you said, which is a lot of people don't know what they're doing. Right? A lot of people are investors crypto traders, but they actually don't know pretty important components of the game. Like I would say, like this question, like quite literally says, and it's the upvoted number one voted question by a lot, what are the tickers for looking up CDS? And it's like, uh... It's okay. It's, it's okay. It's, it, you heard you got to start somewhere. It's 100% okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's like we do have to put the skates on to play hockey. And when Mike said the most important thing is CDS, and I told my, you know, my five-year-olds that are learning how to skate, five and six, got to put the skates on, and then you got to show them how to tie them on their own. It is okay. Honestly, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just saying that that being the number one question is emblematic of exactly what's been going on, is that people are trading all this stuff. They don't even know where to get a quote for CDS. I mean, I, I have my Bloomberg terminal, which not everybody can have. And it is what it is. But I, I just want to make that comment. Hopefully it's not too critical because I, I appreciate that he asked the question. It's, it's important to ask questions in life. And honestly, your product is probably the best. And I don't, 
I am not a paid representative. I am a paying client to, I think I cut a check for you for like 5,000 bucks a year, okay? Um, and uh, just so that I'm not a paid advertisement here for your product, but this is the best product by a country mile on Wall Street for anybody who wants to learn how the machine works. And you're giving a first class education every single day. And so if you're new, I would be looking at those quad numbers, understanding those quad numbers, looking at the entire pitch deck and listening to your calls uh, on a daily basis until you can get up to speed and say, okay, I understand what he's talking about. But if you are an investor in this market, Hedgeye is a, I wish that it was available when I started. I, I appreciate that, Mike. And you know, I do. And I, and, and you know, you're not a bullshit guy and um, I don't bullshit people either. Uh, here's a question away from that question that is a, a, a specific question that I, that I was going to ask you anyway, because I actually just, today I actually just sold all of my tenure. I was long a bunch of tenure bonds, just trading it off the low end of the range like I would, but it, it's, it was a trade. It, it's definitely not a trend. Bond yields are still in a very precarious position, particularly given that we're going to go into like this 95 billion QT and, a, and I, what I think is pretty hot CPI number next week relative to uh, expectations. So that's why I did it. Doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong. But uh, Matt asked this question, Mike, what do you think, if any, are the catalysts for the 10 year Treasury overlay? Is it simply a degradation in economic activity and increase in unemployment, like you've talked about, jobless claims should spike up? Um, uh, just wondering, because these are uh, certain non, or are there certain non traditional metrics that you're focused on here when looking at the Treasury market? Wow, that's an incredibly astute question. An Thank awesome you. question. Yeah, that's, the, that's the second highest voted question. So we go from we got two two levels of players in the game, which is totally cool. That's what we want. We want us all to be so together. My entire view on treasuries, and, and I'm bullish on the ten year, uh, understanding that the chart sucks, and on and on and on and on. on. Uh, but when you are given the menu of what you can buy or must buy, you can't own Japan. You won't own Europe. You can't own Japan or uh, China rather. Uh, you can't own the short end, you can't own leveraged loans, you can't own junk. So what's left? The 10 year. That's it. The long end of the U.S. Treasury curve. That's the only thing that's viable. And so essentially what I have on is that I think we're going to have a more inverted yield curve. That is probably the highest probability event in my mind. Now, imagine that you're running at times 100% net short. How do you <laughs> How do you hedge that in a cost effective manner? Good point. Right? Good point. Right. Well, for about $350,000, you can put on $100 million long the US 10 year on the October uh, mix between October and November lines. So maybe not today because it's a little bit jacked, but a week ago you could. And so I looked at it like this if CPI comes in uh, light, right, uh, the 10 year is going to rip. Yep. in my view, because now it's an all clear, because I think that there is a bolus of money waiting out there to buy the 10 year. Yep. That's my take on it. I agree. All right, and they're just looking for the all clear. Well, if the 10 year lifts and the long end yields go down, we might get a rally in tax starting Tuesday next week on the CPI number. And so how do I defend against being massively short all these names? Well, I get to, I get to have my, my treasury long. And I found it in a way that I don't think I lose any money either way That's because it. the alternative is it comes in crappy and everything blows up. So my treasury trade doesn't work, but I'm going to make way more than that on my short book. That's a great way to articulate uh, a long short strategy and asymmetry and the timing of the bet. I mean, that's such yes. an important thing, Mike. I mean, Tuesday. And, and, and I often wonder, like for all these, uh, you know, these newly minted um, I guess they'll be wearing gloves next time. Bottom pickers, very stinky, um, you know, of stocks. That's all they want to do every day. That's the topic on on whatever channel, uh, old wall media channel. Where's the bottom? Where's the bottom? It, it's much more likely that treasuries on the long end of the curve, like treasury bonds, are about to go into their bull market bottom and go to the bull, bull market than the Nasdaq or crypto. I mean, but there's not a lot of discussion about that, and and I do think that like. It's early days. I mean, you just, I actually said that I think it'd be a little more hawkish because there are a bunch of lagging indicators that won't flip on CPI till the October reported November and numbers after that. But that's just what I'm worried about. Plus, I'm looking at the signal today, which is what makes me move, not my thoughts. Uh, I generally like, I'll, I'll sit here in the morning and I'll have one thought 
and then I'll turn my screen on and I'll say, okay, do the opposite of that thought. <laughs> I'm sure you do that too. But, um, but you know, this reversal here today in, in uh, TLT and in IEF, I think that that could easily be, like you said, if, if you're wrong on treasuries for a little bit, you're going to be right on your short book on equities for a lot. Yes. And, and that's typically something that uh, most hedge fund uh, guys really don't know how to do is to go through the entire matrix and find an asymmetric setup where you look at it this thing and I'm kind of looking at it and I have it set up and I kind of stress tested it on, uh, on my notebook, you know, that's it, just a pen and paper on my notebook, stress testing it. And I was like, well, if it moves this much, I'll do that. If it moves this much, I'll do that. And then I come away with the story of, well, if I know what the timing is, I'm not sure how I lose money. And honestly, that's how I want to come out of every month, ideally, and every trade where I'm like, I don't understand how I lose money in this. And that's how I approach all yeah. my trades is how do I lose money? Articulate to myself, Mike Taylor, how does Mike Taylor lose money? And that's how this troglodyte is always talk, got my club in hand. And I'm just saying, how do I lose money? How do I lose money? And that is what I'm always asking myself all the time. Because if I don't ask myself, I will lose money. <laughs> and, and when I find these situations where I'm like, I'm not sure how I lose money, then I get really big. I like that. I like me too. And I mean, hey, you know, like it. I was looking at this just now. I mean, I was talking to another hedge fund client right before we got on. I said, you know where the, you know where the low end of the range on the VIX just went? He's like, where? 22 something? I'm like, no, it's actually closer to 24 now. That 24. Like if you know, if you're short like Mike Taylor short equities, you want you want that VIX low end of the range to keep climbing because the top end of the range is going to go through the roof, and that's again a really scary uh, setup. Quickly up because we only have a couple more minutes here, uh, Mike. But the, <laughs> this is a great question. It's ranked number thir number three, and I already asked the top two. This is Tim B in Fort Worth, Texas. Tejas. Uh, can you get Mike to move his head a bit so we can see the rest of his board? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and then he wrote, Troglodytes Unite. I love it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, some of these names are old, but they're, uh, they're all, a lot of them are uh, zeros. And uh, it's, not, um, it's not representative of my book entirely uh, because there's always new things coming in and out. I just haven't updated in a while. Because uh, the movements here haven't really been these names. It's really the um, inflation and how do I position this book for a situation where I make money no matter what happens. So I think uh, next Tuesday we're going to have either. And by the way, like I don't care what the CPI number is. I'm literally trading for a three day trade on this because maybe we get some follow through. I don't care. Like if stocks rip because inflation's over and everything's fine, you sell the crap out of that lift. And I'm just hoping that we get another shot to sell. And that's what I'm really hoping for. So I've downsized a little bit in that regard, but I have a very large position in treasuries on and so forth. So it's, uh, it, it's an exciting moment. I will be glued to the tape trying to uh, process all the information and get through it and, uh, and make some money. But, um, but so I'm sorry, these names aren't perfectly representative of what I'm doing in my well, book. Well, let, uh, let's just finish on that, which is real, you know, real life, real practitioner, because so many people are posing and, you know, part of the back slapping network on Twitter. A lot of people here that are listening to this, uh, obviously today are listening to it for free. So I, we all appreciate Mike's time and, you know, and, and you putting up with, uh, all of you putting up with my latest rant and, and you know, whatever I'm going to say. Uh, but again, there are a lot of people out there that have never run money. And there are a lot of people out there that do, that don't do it well. So when somebody says, oh, he doesn't run a fund anymore, Mike doesn't run a fund anymore, you want to see his returns like when he's running a fund? He can sit there and trade a significant, much more significant PA than most people on the earth can trade because he did really well running money. So there are people that run money well. There are people that run money that don't run it well. And then there are people who've never run it at all, which people listen to on macro, which is even, to me entirely amazing and probably part of the probably one of the biggest parts of the bubble in and of itself. Um, what would you say, what would you say to, to the broader community about all that? Because there's, there's a bubble in noise, right? There's a bubble I talked about this morning on the macro show. 
the, you know, a guy won a Nobel Prize for it. It's obviously all out there, but he, I don't think he could have imagined the, the noise and meme stocks and macro views, macro tourism, I call it. Like that bubble, what is it? How much uh, do you pay attention to it? Do you use it as a, I, I built a nice Contra stream, Mike, on Twitter that I really like, Ooh. but I, I keep it to myself, Contra stream. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. What, what do you, what That's do you, got value. what do you think about that? Uh, I watch, I actually watch the meme stocks a lot and I frequently am involved with them one way or another, uh, usually on the short side, uh, because they're usually zeros, but that is the tenor. It was, uh, there was a few weeks ago when the market just topped, uh, and, uh, I, I tweeted and I said, uh, bed, bath and beyond, uh, blowing up, uh, which it did will be the spark that ignites this sell off. And, and it did. Whether I'm right or not, that's what happened. And it, uh, it blew up and everything sold off. And, and, it, and it, part of the reason is, is that right now, the incremental dollars that are moving the market around is a lot of retail money. Yeah. And that's new. And so that's one thing you always have to do in this job to do it well, is that you have to keep an open mind and that everything you think and believe will change in time. And it'll change again and again and again. And it's a moving target. It's never the same. And that's part of what I love about it is that it always surprises me and humbles me. And it forces me to have an open mind all the time. You know, I'm a troglodyte that's trying to learn a new language. I'm a little bit slow at it. I love that. And that's why he purposefully, because he, he knew when he moved his head, some of you are going to do it like the old way, which is there, there are his picks. I'm going to buy the picks. And then he said, no, 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 no. They change, okay? They change. Just like anything in life, it changes. So uh, if you've been taught that markets operate any other way, that's false. In fact, markets in this day and age move faster than most things in natural life. Uh, <laughs> you should get used to being uncomfortable with that. Be comfortable being uncomfortable like Mike this. He looks great. Um, we got to wrap it up here, man. But you do look great. Uh, what you're doing for Thank our- you much. What you're doing for our community is beyond great, and I'm, I'm sincerely grateful for that. I've told you that in person many times, and I'll shake your hand and give you a hug next time to say it again. But I mean, you know, spending time on Twitter spaces, helping people really understand the, bit, the, the base pack of the game, and a lot of different, you spend a lot of your time, Mike, and you, do, you don't have to, and I know you do it from, from, a, from a very good place, because you, you want people to preserve and protect capital. You don't want them to blow up. And that's what we, we're not trying to achieve that today, trying to scare people on that front. We're actually trying to help people. And you're, you're one of my main guys in doing that. So uh, thank you very much for doing that on Hedge Eye TV. It's an honor to help everyone out. As you know, I don't, I don't sell anything. Uh, and uh, I've made enough money where I can do kind of whatever the heck I want and just trade, which I love to do it. And so I'm just doing what I love to do. I'm helping people through pink. I'm helping cancer through pink. And I'm helping everybody that I can out there because I really enjoy it. I enjoy the process. And believe it or not, and I enjoy the people and yeah. the questions because they yeah. make me think about things I never thought about. And, uh, and that's what we get. In the meantime, I'll just be racing every weekend with my son, and that's life. <laughs> so I love that. So and, and, and congrats, see you soon, all right? Congrats to you and Max. You know, Max is his son, uh, who has done a phenomenal job uh, rising up in the ranks on the racing circuits. But again, you know, good people, good people that you can trust. I'll let you figure out how many of those that you can find in today's modern media. Thank you for spending the time with us today. Hey there, Hedge Eye Nation, or if you're not part of Hedge Eye Nation, thanks for watching Hedge Eye on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to click on the button below there. Subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also follow the link in the description to our website to get even more great investing content.